Our next guest was one of our favourites at our conference two years ago. In fact, she's one of the favourite people on TV around the country at the moment. Popular, but also feared, if you're a politician. Of course, I'm talking about Virginia Trioli. Journalist, Walkley Award winner, newsbreaker, and the most formidable host of ABC News Breakfast. Please make her welcome. Dennis, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you again. I thought it was last year that I was here. I'm, I'm losing time. It was two years ago. That's how warm the welcome was last time, so it seems like it was only yesterday. Um, I'm going to ask our panellists to come up to the stage now while I'm um, speaking and I introduce you, if that's OK. I hope you all remembered where I said you had to see it. <laughs> Don't make me tell you again. Um, disrupting politics. Haha. <laughs> well... Some might say that's what Clive Palmer's for. <laughs> that's not quite what we mean. We mean something a little more uh, constructive, something a little more thoughtful, something a little less thought bubbleish or brain fartish, however you're feeling, if I, was, if I was to speak crudely, as I know that Dennis doesn't like us to do, um, and something a little more community-based and something that's more about change. And I know that's always what this um, meeting, this conference every year is about, and what you, uh, as representatives of your organisations, what you're about as well. Well, the people who are joining you today on this panel, they're about that too. We're going to talk about some new forms of citizen engagement, I guess the reality of that, uh, how that actually sees when you move from the idealistic embryonic stage into something a little more real and just what the appetite might be in the community for such kind of disruptive politics and, can I say, disruptive politicians or are we talking here about the anti-politician model altogether? Well, let's see. So why don't you meet your panellists? They're going to speak to you for about five minutes each, just outlining where they um, butt up against this concept of, um, of disrupting politics. Then uh, we're going to have a discussion with you. Um, as ever, we really like this to be a, a really engaged session. Uh, I'll take questions at any time. It's not sort of a formal you know, Q&A discussion up here and involving you from the beginning. So starting from the end, Dennis Ginovan is uh, a founding member and current vice president of Voices for Indi. Now, there's a disruption to politics for you. That was a grassroots democracy organisation, of course, formed in mid-2012, did very well. It unseated Sophie Mirabella and uh, put in her place uh, a very strong representative for the seat of Indi. Dennis is a social worker and mediator, a Churchill Fellow, an adjunct prof professor at Charles Sturt University. He was raised in farming communities and has since always lived and uh, worked in rural and regional Australia. Carolyn Hendricks... No. See, you didn't sit where I asked you to sit. No, <laughs> I did ask you to sit there, didn't I? It's my fault. Mm. Damn it. Joanne Yates. <laughs> Joanne was the C20 Sherpa charged with coordinating civil society's input into the G20's economic policy reform agenda. She has a history of public policy development and advocacy on social justice and equity, holding senior management roles in the public sector and for industry associations. She's been a senior political advisor to a number of politicians, recently working for the now deputy leader of the opposition, Tanya Plibersek. Rowan Wen is with us as well, a broadcast journalist. Rowan has worked as a news reporter for various networks and an investigative reporter for both Today Tonight and A Current Affair. After finishing at Today Tonight, Rowan became Senator Nick Xenophon's Chief of Staff before joining online advocacy and campaign organisation GetUp as their communications director. He holds an honours degree in political science from Melbourne University and a postgraduate diploma in journalism. And Carolyn Hendricks, her work examines the democratic practices of contemporary governance with a particular focus on public deliberation. She teaches courses, uh, graduate courses in the Masters of Public Policy at ANU. So we're very pleased she's come down to join us today. She's also a member of the Research Committee of the New Democracy Foundation. Please welcome your panellists this afternoon. Dennis, can I start with you? Just um, five minutes on, uh, on where you line up with this idea. Thanks very much, Virginia. And I'm very, I'm very pleased to be here and to be here with my colleagues and friends and others from the region called Indi, which is, for those who don't know, is in northeast Victoria. So if the Great Divide is to the east of it, the Murray River's to the north, the outskirts of Melbourne's to the south, 
and the Hume Highway going through from Sydney to Melbourne is to the west. So it's the name of a federal electorate and for a long time I used to have a bit of a joke about this because it seemed like a word that would get pulled out of the shed every time there was a federal election yes. <laughs> and, and then it would get put back in the shed. The only way in which that, na- that word seemed to be familiar was because it named a federal electorate. But now it seems to have become a verb. And, you know, <laughs> what, what happens is it actually seems to be a little bit evocative of what happens when communities decide that they want to have a say, to get engaged, to become part of the political process, to find a way to better connect with their politician. And in a way, rather than get told by a politician what's going to be happening, to tell them what's going to be happening, to sort of set that sense of responsibility that a community can take up to express themselves in a political way. So a little bit of background. So in, 19, in 2012, a small group of people met to discuss this issue, because this, this, this preceded what has happened. Uh, and, when, and there was a group of people who felt quite, I guess, um, um, uncertain about what would happen, maybe a little bit uh, um, hesitant about the, the risk that it could, could, it could mean to people to be seeing, um, a, seeing people publicly talking about politics and how it could be done differently in a very, what had been a very conservative held seat. So we did get together. We did um, decide that we needed to re, um, act on what it was that our children were saying to us. And one of the key things was, um, is this as good as it gets here? Is this a region that's ha- happy with way, the way in which politics is working? And if, if it is, and then I'm not coming back. We, we, it was really, it did feel like, a, we felt as if we had a generational responsibility to act on that perception that um, politics was disengaged uh, disinterested, uh, fait accompli, and l- unlikely to change. So, through this, very in a very quick way, we developed a set of uh, processes. The key one being a ki- a kitchen table conversations, which was a way in which we would have respectful conversations with a ten to twelve people in any setting, maybe a pub or in a house, wherever, to talk about the issues that mattered. Um, why they love living in that region, what it is they would want to see happen uh, differently, how do, you like it, what, how do you like your political representation, what would you do if you actually wanted to see a better engagement with the political process. And that, those kitchen table conversations, they ended up being collated in a, in a report which contained um, the input of 500 people. And this report here is the one that we would, um, it's available to describe a lot of the processes that occurred. And in leading up to the federal election in 2013, we gave that, that report to anyone who looked like they were going to be standing, um, or, or actually standing, um, in the federal election. Um, we, through that time, we became aware that it didn't look like we would get the sort of voice we wanted, because people weren't interested in this. I think the, the, the party structure was the one in which they were used to. So we said, well, maybe we should act on the recommendations that we, we received through the process, and that was to call for a candidate to stand as an independent and, and still represent the views of what people were talking about in Indi. So we did that, um, and uh, a person by the name of Cathy McGowan was uh, pre-selected, so to speak, and then through that, and then she launched her campaign, and Voices for Indi, in a way, stepped back from that because it was then Cathy's campaign, Cathy's process, um, and as you may be aware, that uh, she won that election in 2013, and with, on, the, on the expectation that a federal member would be listening to what it was that the community wanted to, to be saying and, to, and, and on the basis of them wanting to be heard. So Cathy um, won the campaign based on that core premise. Yep. One minute? Just one more. Yep. Okay. Um, and since then, we are embarking on further projects uh, that have a, a focus on ethics and accountability in politics. Another one called uh, rural proofing, the idea that if, if, a, if a policy uh, is proposed at a federal or state level or, where, or anywhere really, but if we can get um, a sense of confidence in the average voter or elector who would um, want to know, well, does that policy actually impact negatively or positively on, on us living in a rural setting? So it's becoming increasing the literacy around how to evaluate policy positions. Okay, we'll uh, ask some um, further questions of Dennis as our conversation gets started. Let's move to Joanne Yates now. Joanne, you're very much an, an insider. Are you also an outsider? Are you a disruptor as well? A disruptor? Uh, well, not sure about that, but let me 
uh, just start off by saying that I'm absolutely delighted to be here and um, speaking to a room full of people deeply engaged in their own communities is a really great privilege. So thank you for sharing your time with us as we're up here on stage sharing ours with you. Um, I started uh, in politics way, way back, in fact, in the deep dark ages before the internet was even part of our system of operating. So I've seen you know, sort of the, the other side of Dennis's experience where you can kind of corral and get people together in a much more easier fashion than having two separate offices from electorate office based far away from Canberra to one in Canberra where you had to kind of pick up bags of paper with you to, <laughs> to make your office functional, let alone even just being able to email. So a great deal of change over the time since I first started with the Australian Democrats back in 1996 um, when the Howard government was first elected. Um, that for us was a kind of disruptive politics in a way. We were the balance of power in the Senate, although that seems to be a sort of fairly common thing these days. At that time, it was fairly unusual. And the Democrats at the time decided that it would go from being its own representation to trying to influence public policy outcomes um, and sought to amend a great deal of legislation. And probably the most um, obvious and famous one was the GST negotiations that we did back in um, over 1998 to 2000. Um, but what we tried to do through that process was really to look after the most vulnerable and the most marginalised in our community. So we were the party, in fact, that exacted the, um, the exemptions for health, for education, for aged care. We ensured that there were compensation packages for those on um, the lowest incomes. Um, it does feel like a very, very long time ago, however, that uh, that was part of our political dialogue. The disruption now seems, as, as Virginia sort of described in her opening, um, is more about the anti-politician model. It's absolutely not people like Cathy, that must be said, or the independents that have held seats in the lower house prior to her coming in. And the, the two in Rob Oakeshott and Tony Windsor are two exemplary independents, I think, and thank goodness we have a democratic system which allows people's participation at that individual level, representing in, um, individual communities at that very grassroots way at, at a national, federal level. And I think that's something that is um, to be celebrated. Um, I don't want to take up too much time because I'm really interested in actually hearing from what the, you as an audience have to say, but my other great passion if, if we're talking about disruptive politics is about challenging the representation, who are the people in our current parliamentary system. And it must be said that there are too few women uh, in, our, in our parliamentary um, representation, it must be said. Only 29% of all parliamentarians are women. Only 20% of all ministerial positions are women and there's even a gendered approach to that, so they tend to be social affairs ministers or health ministers or education ministers or the shadows thereof, although that's changed in recent times, thankfully, with foreign affairs. But there has never been, for example, a female defence minister or a female treasurer, except the first in New South Wales just recently elected. Only 8% of women hold parliamentary secretary positions, and these are really important supportive positions to um, ministers. They carry a great deal of work in supporting the ministers and their broader portfolios, but they also come with them extra um, allowances and extra entitlements for having their say in party rooms and so on, debates that inform pu public policy positions. Um, out of our last round of elections, 27% of women candidates stood for the Senate, slightly more at 27.5 for the lower house, and yet we comprise 50% 50 50 of the population. Um, we've fallen in rank from our representation in Parliament to being 20th of all nations in 2001 to just 48 today. So if we're going to talk about disruption, I think women in leadership positions is a really important place to start. But I'll leave that for the board. OK, great. Thanks, Chuck. Rowan Wynn, where do you, how do you line up with this particular topic today? Good question. Um, <laughs> I've probably come at this from a more commercial point of view previously. Obviously, I um, studied uh, politics and journalism at university, and then I had to make a clear decision as to which way I would go. I have worked at the ABC for a couple of years, um, but I made a, a complete decision, a, a clear decision to move into commercial current affairs and television. The reason I did that is because at the time I did that, um, three million Australians watched either TT or ACA and they couldn't all be stupid and they couldn't all be deserving of patron, uh, being patronised by us. So I took the view that if you're progressive enough and you have a progressive view, maybe there is a, a chance to get in there and try and drag the argument into the middle. In my experience, um, the Australian people are fundamentally 
good people and fair people, if presented with the right information, they almost always come out on the right side, but they're fed a lot of crap. As you know, if you watch the promos and certainly occasionally watch the shows, some of these things can be fairly challenging. And so my view was to get in there for a time and try and just, you know, put a little pepperoni on the pizza and try and reintroduce a little bit more debate to these things so that people weren't getting the same stuff from the same people telling them the same things. And, yeah, it, it led to a lot of battles, you know. Internally, there was a lot of... I don't know what it's like at the ABC these days, but certainly at seven and nine, you know, if you try and drag things into the middle, you're accused of being a lefty, which I can kind of live with, but... Um, We're always being accused of being lefties. I know. It's a shocker, <laughs> isn't it? What do you do? But so what else is new? Well, that's right. A lefty thinker, they're kind of the same thing. You know, somebody asking a question <laughs> here and there. But anyway, that was the battle. And look, it was a battle worth fighting, and it wasn't an easy battle. Um, I must admit that I had more than my fair share of, um, of, of fights with management, but I think it's been worth it, because I think that, as I said, when you stack these things up in front of people they almost always come out on the right side if they've got the right information in front of them. And to me, that is the real challenge of current politics, is that as we move further and further into the soundbite, and I'll get to Xenophon in a second, but as we move further and further into... <laughs> sorry, don't put those two ideas together. That was my fault. Um, you're going to see that we are really moving into a level of political discourse that doesn't necessarily engage the mind as much as it should. We're all incredibly busy. We've all got social media. We're all jumping around. People are unfocused. And this is the time when I think that if you can present the facts to the people, you'll end up getting them in the right place. The other big adventure, of course, was joining Nick. Nick and I had been friends for many, many years. Um, he actually came to my wedding, or my wife and my wedding, um, years and years ago. And he decided to run federally and there was a lot of pushback at the time. A lot of people thought this guy's a joke. You know, he'd done a lot of stunts in South Australia. He was known as the stunt man. He'd get dressed up and do goofy stuff. And um, he was going to run federally. He was incredibly popular. I think he got 2% oh, of the vote the first time around and just got all his preferences and which got him in. Subsequent to that, he got one in four votes, which clearly means he was doing something right. And what he was doing was not talking over the heads of the punters. He was actually talking to the people and addressing the issues that matter to them. That is the key to politics. The, the, the easiest way to knock down a tree is to find a tree that's already falling and stand behind it and push. Well, that's kind of what Nick did in the sense that he found out what people actually cared about, got behind it and helped them push it. And that, that to me, was the way the Xenophon train was always going to go when it hit Canberra. There were a lot of people waiting for Nick when he got there with you know, brick bats to... Um, to mock him, we did wind back the stunts for obvious reasons because I think a lot of South Australians were concerned that he would be embarrassing. But what he was was a disruptive brand. And what Nick managed to do and still manages to do is to be the voice of reason. We had a real challenge in the sense that we had the balance of power very quickly. Sorry, one minute. We had the balance of power for a bunch of years. So we had three years. We, we knew we had three years. We had Fielding, Steve Fielding, who was fun to work with and wonderfully entertaining. We had the Grains and we had um, Nick Xenophon. And we had to make sure that within three years he was seen as the voice of reason, the guy who would tell the truth. And so you'd get the major parties coming out and you could predict what they were going to say before the door stop. And the major media would walk out and go, Labor's saying this, the Libs are saying this, Nick, who's telling the truth? And that was the great position to be in. And that is what happens when you engage with the community because the punters aren't stupid, you know, and I shouldn't call them punters, but the, the voters are not silly. And if you can anticipate what they're thinking by actually talking to them and actually engaging with them, that is the trick to modern politics communication as I see it, Virginia. Yes, thank you very much. Sorry. <laughs> well, thank you. Well done, Rowan, yes. <laughs> Carolyn, is, is there a, um, an academic point of view in all of this that there must be some interesting history, I guess, if you look back at the idea of, of politics and disruption in this country too? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't going to talk about the academic stuff, but I, I can. Um, what I tell my students when I start talking about this is that I actually trained as an engineer and they all walk out of the room thinking I'm going to talk <laughs> about some technocratic thing. But I guess engineers are trained in process thinking and, um, and now as a political scientist, I guess what I'm really interested in, how can we improve our democratic process? That's been my fascination and interest for the last 15 years or so. And I've been really interested in, I guess, um, not just the theory of democracy, but, but how can we in contemporary um, society with all the complexities um, that Hugh sort of painted for us this morning. Um, how can we bring everyday citizens um, more closely into our political system in a way that is meaningful to them and also changes people's um, uh, capacity to live? And I guess uh, I've been particularly interested in structured processes that try and do that. So when we hear of citizen engagement, most of us sort of I uh, think, ugh, citizen sort of town hall meetings or uh, opinion polls or even focus groups, which most of us know can be pretty empty democratic processes. 
Um, but I've been looking at a whole range of innovative forms of citizen engagement that try and include um, randomly selected citizens. So may, very much like a legal jury. So some of you may have heard of citizens juries or citizens assemblies. Um, now, you wouldn't know this, but Australia is actually one of the leaders in the, in the world in actually experimenting with these kinds of democratic processes. Um, and what's interesting, I think, is that the NGO sector has been particularly um, you know, at the cutting edge of experimenting with these processes. Um, when I first started looking at these things about 15 years ago, um, maybe just step back and explain what these processes are. So uh, many of you have probably heard of them, but let me just explain um, what they do. They bring a small group of about 15 to 20 randomly selected citizens together um, for a period of three to five days, sometimes over four or five months, to really um, get to the nuts and bolts of an issue. They hear from different experts, different advocacy groups, different business groups on an issue, and then they come up with a set of recommendations um, for decision makers. In some cases, they have decision making power. Um, in, when these processes were first introduced, a lot of um, interest groups and I guess people like yourselves who work in the advocacy sector were really quite fearful of handing over issues to randomly selected people. I always find this interesting because we, we allow um, legal juries to sort of determine the fate of someone's life in some countries, but we won't hand over policy to ordinary people. Um, but what these processes show is that people are actually really willing to get involved. Um, ordinary citizens are more than capable. Um, what I've found in my research, I guess, is that um, the NGO and the advocacy sector are actually really interested in these processes. The politicians are too, so I've been doing some really interesting interviews with MPs who've been running these sorts of processes in parliamentary committees, for example. Um, but the, the big block, I think, is with um, our media. Sorry, Virginia. Um, Go for it. You can just probably remember the Julia Gillard made an announcement for a citizens' assembly um, a couple of years ago, and everyone pounced on that idea for a lot of reasons, but the, some of the democratic reasons weren't really understood. Um, and the other blockage, I think, is also um, you know, at the bureaucratic level. So some of our administrators, civil servants, really have trouble handing over. Um, power, their, their kind of administrative power to ordinary citizens. Um, so most of you in the room know that ordinary citizens are more than capable of understanding complex issues and deciding on things, um, but many of our bureaucrats don't. So um, that's probably where I'll leave things. Yep. Look, it's interesting that we're, um, we, we finished the, this part with, with you and with that observation because it strikes me as, as quite um, interesting and also inspiring that clearly the issue of marriage equality in this country now, thanks to Ireland in large part, uh, is classically an issue where the people have been way ahead of the parliament. And the people are now take, literally dragging the parliament to a different position. There, I, I think Malcolm Turnbull's right. There probably will be a vote on this by the end of the year in parliament. And, uh, and no doubt if people are free to vote their, their true belief in their mind, it'll pass. But it only got there because um, clearly the people, the politicians have, have looked at the polls, have, have gone back to their electorates again and again and had to answer the same question of why. why. Can you tell me yet again why you're standing in the way of this? And that's an interesting example of, um, of, of the people having, having a view, and I guess it, it also intersects with what you're saying today as well, Rowan. You know, they, they get there and it's a matter of whether politicians kind of catch up with them. I want to ask Dennis just to sort of kick off our conversation. Can the Indi model work anywhere? Do there need to be certain preconditions in order for it to work? I, th I think there's certainly um, a need for people to feel uh, it's time to do something about your own circumstances. And, um, so it can't the, be imposed. Like it needs to be sort of like a, like a ground roots groundswell of, of discontent yeah, at the very I, least. I think, I think that's, I'd, so I'd suggest that's a, a common trigger that people can relate to, uh, but it doesn't have to be the primary thing. There may be other... Um, other aspects too, in terms of the the history of, a, of a, an electorate, or what's happening in a neighbouring electorate. I'm not sure if it, many of you would be aware of what happened in Shepparton recently. Was that the because of what it? Uh, you know, not because of Indi changed hands, and uh, a year and a half later, in a state seat, an independent got into uh, the seat of Shepparton. Um, and I think it was because partly I think there was an ex an exhibition of what is possible if you change your. Your, your, your circumstances. So to me, that was a. It, it felt like a driver. I've done, not done research to back that up, but I think that's another another mm. parameter. Um, and I think you know, in, up in um, northern New South Wales, there's been some real serious pressure 
because of uh, environmental issues that are actually united a lot of people around the actual issue of water quality and the impacts of uh, coal seam gas on water quality to people who live uh, near there and downstream of there. So there's some of those factors coming into play too. That there's a, there's a, co a common challenge yep. and, a, and a common, a, a, a seen to be a common opportunity to do, go somewhere else. Can I see some hands? Anyone who wants to jump in with an observation or a question? I know there must be many, many in the room. It's difficult talking about the press as a whole because we're not. I mean, Virginia and I are different people, but we're doing different, different jobs, obviously. But certainly it was despicable being up there watching it. I was actually there on the lawn on the day and we couldn't believe that these Liberal politicians walked up and thought this was OK. It got filmed, it got broadcast, it was normalised. It was problematic. Do I think Gillard had a tougher gig? Absolutely I do. Do I think there's sexism? There is. And I'm, I've got to say, I'm with Joanne on this a thousand percent. And let's start with the construct of Canberra. It is the most family unfriendly place to be. There is no daycare in Camp Canberra anymore. I believe the childcare thing is closed now, you know, so you can't even do that. And my wife, who is, has more politics than I do and is smarter than I do, she's got a PhD, she wouldn't go up there. You know, it, it's crazy. It's unfriendly. It is made for middle class, upper class, white, middle aged men. And that is the problem. And that is what you saw. And unfortunately, it's up to men, I think, and this was the great lost opportunity, it's up to men to say, no, stop it. You know, there were men who sat quietly when Julia Gillard was being vilified, and I thought that was disgraceful. What you walk past is what you endorse, and they're endorsing it. And there should have been many more people on both sides, thank you, there have been many more people on both sides of politics who said, this is not cool. Joanne, can I get you to jump in here? Certainly, um, and I think that the, the fact that uh, the Prime Minister's misogyny speech went so viral so quickly um, is absolutely testament to the fact that this was about our first female Prime Minister. No, not here, because it, it, it came back. You're absolutely right. But I think that was because it was such an extraordinary thing. I can't think of another circumstance where, where the highest office of a country would be so dreadfully treated. It hasn't happened to Angela Merkel. It didn't happen to Margaret Thatcher. You know, a range of examples where... Well, they gave it a good go with Margaret Thatcher. I've got to well, jump they in did, there. Yeah. But, but, and, you know, I think there's also um, a bit about the, the way that News Limited operates here in this country. As, as Maury Schwartz said earlier, very, very heavily weighted media in this country. Um, and I think just the opportunity for some independent um, coverage. But I think she was very, very, very fairly untreated. And I hope we never see the likes of it again. Um, I think uh, the Margaret Thatcher example is, a, is a, uh, I think, an example of where it's, it's not party political and it gets down to pure misogyny. Mm. Because if you're, a, if you're a tough woman, if you are a tough bird and you stick your jaw out, you will get it. And Margaret Thatcher was without doubt one of those women. And she was unapologetic. And let's leave the politics out of, for, out of it entirely for this conversation. And I think you'll see great similarities, actually, there in terms of the treatment mm -hmm. and the way those two women conducted themselves, which was unapologetic, um, on the front foot, thoughtful, intelligent, and bang. Helen Clark was kind of similar. Yeah, yeah. that's right. So that's just... Hey, I, that's just old-fashioned misogyny. Indeed. And yeah. I, look, I look forward to the day when women entering those kind of positions is, never, is no longer seen as kind of surprising or abnormal, that it's just something that an office is able to do. Uh, so our second um, question is here. Hi. Carolyn, as someone who, who teaches um, young people who are in this area, do, have you formed a view? I mean, do, they, do they impart to you their, their reflections and their view on, on issues like this and their hesitation about the field? Um, I mean, most, m many of my students are international so, and, and a lot of women, so it's interesting hearing international women talk about what they perceive in Australia. Um, you know, and there are a lot of women in, a, in the Australian undergraduate system that, that would want to get into um, politics, I think. But I do think there's a cultural dimension, which I think we've talked about. But there is a sort of broader structural systemic um, issue here, which is just the word family. I mean, uh, women have other, uh, other responsibilities, so do men. But juggling that um, is always a compromise, you know, and... Um, and how, how families, whether that's the man or the woman, to juggle that is, is something I think that, that does take its toll on, on politicians, men and women. Um, but I think there's, it, there's, there's a lot of questions to be asked about how, how can we make that lifestyle more um, family friendly? And particularly if it's going into this very public 
um, or the publicity so high and the vilification so high? Like, what what are what are the attractions, particularly to women, for going into such a career? Unless it's done differently, um, unless I don't know, using the indi- example. Um, You sort of have a a lone wolf, if you like, someone not someone who's captive to a party but who comes from an extraordinarily supportive base. That's maybe another example. I think through through that um, through that campaign, there was 700 people who signed up as um, volunteers for the campaign, and they also signed up and witnessed and dated their signature, um, a commitment to a set of values that um, that included uh, you know respect. Courtesy, uh, commitment to the goal, commitment to the purpose of the campaign, and um, they, they, I, they, I were very, they were very, they were very uh, deliberate about uh, not wanting to go out there and personally vilify yeah. Sophie Mirabella, so, for example. So it was all there. That was all off the record, and uh, sorry, all off the screen. That was just not part of the campaign. If yeah. an indivi- if, if if an individual decided to have a you know cathartic moment, and, you know, let it all go, well. The bottom line was they would not. They would have to own the, and take personal responsibility for what they said. Have said it won't be wouldn't be owned by the campaign. Yeah. So, and I think there's only one person that, that where we would have needed to sort of just swing that idea past them. No, I think I had a question over here. Yes, go ahead. Who would like to start off there, Joanne? Oh, goodness. Um, I think you're absolutely right, and I think that it, it absolutely horrifies me, the current um, the recommendations of the Senate Select Committee that looked into those whole range of um, ways of shutting down our democratic participation. I think it's a really, really dangerous path that we seek to go down. Putting aside whether you agree that Glenn Drury gamed the system or not, um, the fact that individual members can put up their... Or individual people in the community can put up their hand and participate in our in our democratic system I think is one that we ought to continue to celebrate rather than close down the system that um, that seeks to have them elected I think the other thing and I'll, I might throw a question back if I may sure. Derek, um, what the, the Democrats experienced as a and you know Nick probably does this too that once you're there once you're in Parliament if you're lucky enough to be elected you still suffer the two-party political system the whole system is set up for two opposing sides. There's a government side, there's an opposition side. Those members stand at a dispatch box and yell at each other. That's the form of our political debate. The Democrats, in, as, the, as the balance of power position, then sought to amend the way that politics was discussed and the way that issues were deliberated, legislation was amended and debated by challenging the membership of the parliamentary committee system. So those committees are, uh, deliberate over all sort, every single piece of legislation um, can be put to one of these committees and they're broad in membership. And for the first time under um, Australian Democrats changes, individuals and smaller political parties could chair those committees and could recommend legislation be examined by them. Those committees also open up themselves to broader democratic participation. So you can submit to them, you can appear before them, you can have your voice heard by them in a system which which necessarily leaves you outside of it. You've got your voice through your parliamentarian and that's kind of it. So the committee system is really, really important and is open to that democratic participation and I think that's worth um, continued support for. I'm just wondering now that you know Kathy's gone through this really lovely experience of grassroots participation and campaigning. What's her experience been like? If you can speak for her mm. now that she's there, suffering that system, she, her <laughs> ability to answer questions is limited. Her ability to engage yep. through other than you know making speeches at sort of ten o'clock at night when no one's around to listen to it. Uh, you know her participation once she's now in the house is very limited. Yeah, How was, does she get around that? But well. My, my sense is that um, well, I've heard Cathy uh, talk about this, but so I won't actually say what she says directly. Because I've, but it, my sense is that there's a certain amount of theatre involved in question time. It's all, it's all, it's all sort of all for the, for the, you know, the, the, the entertainment or the, the way which you could show how politics sort of is happening. But what, she, what I sense is there's so much more importance played on. What, if she knows what the issues are, as she does, the issues that are being raised in our, in our electorate then she can do... A lot of the work is done between the v- visible political process. It's meeting with MPs, say rural MPs or other rural MPs, whether they be Labor or Liberal, who have a similar issue with NBN. So they've got the same issue. They need to get together. They need to, they need to share information. So there's all these sort of niche opportunities that fall in between the big rocks 
for other for other processes to to um, play out. And so she's getting stuff done. Yeah, yeah. I think that's my, my impression. Uh, I just wanted to follow up from the question about the uh, pre-selection of people who come in from outside the electorate. Um, that uh, I, I think that's that's becoming a really difficult thing for to do and, and to to win on. I think that's that unless unless they have some sort of you know, magician. But I just think that's begun to become much more of a challenge for someone to actually get traction coming from somewhere else because the literacy of the community is changing. The, mm. the, the expectations of the community is changing. Um, and I think the, the idea that uh, someone can just pick up because it's a, if it's a party decision, someone is from outside the electorate, but chances are have made that decision. Rowan, um, can I, we hear from you in relation to that question though about the system shutting down to protect itself? Look, it definitely happens. I mean, people don't give up power voluntarily, unfortunately. Um, I am looking now at the reforms to the Senate, the suggested reforms to the Senate, and I'm slightly concerned by the fact that, you know, Nick got less than 2% of the vote, I think, in the first election, then one in four the second, and will there ever be another Nick, you know, and, or will he be shut out of the system? And is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Now, I personally think Glenn Jury is great at maths and is not necessarily great for democracy, but the question is how limited do you want it to be? Just touching on your point about, uh, about your involvement in Parliament, my view to Nick from the get-go was nothing important ever happens in those rooms. So don't waste time giving speeches and being silly in the red room or the green room. You know, yeah. That is just showbiz for bored people. Seriously, take it outside and talk to the masses. That is how you actually change things. And that's what Nick did, if you notice. We didn't do a lot of stuff in the Senate unless it was a Scientology speech. And that's the trick. <laughs> don't worry about... My argument is don't worry what happens in there. It's all been sorted. It's all predetermined. If you want to mess things up, if you want to disrupt, disrupt outside. Be an outside guy. Carolyn? Yeah, I mean, I just want to pick up on this point. It's, um, I mean, democracy is a lot more than just voting every three or four years. I mean, this, this system of representative democracy that we have embedded here and in most liberal Western democracies is essentially broke. Um, most people who have been studying this realise this, you know, that, that most of our elected representatives are poorly connected to their communities. In some of our electorates in, in Australia, they are massive geographical areas. It's just physically impossible for our MPs to know and connect with their communities. Um, and if I've been doing some interviews with MPs about how they connect with their own constituents, and um, you'd be surprised how unsophisticated, um, or maybe not, <laughs> you wouldn't be surprised, um, that they, if you were to ask a CEO or any of you in the audience about how you connect with your constituents, you'd have probably a fairly sophisticated way of connecting with communities, your communities. But our MPs, sadly, it's not, it's not part of their contemporary model. They're much busier with, with working with the media. So the second thing I think is that our, our, our elected representative model is based on a geographical model of how communities work, mm. right? So, but we know our communities span well beyond our electorates, right? I might want a woman to represent me on this particular issue. I might want my sporting group to do this. So our representatives are actually not always our elected representatives. And so certainly in democratic thinking, there's a lot of push to think about representation in a much broader way than just being elected into parliament. Can I just jump in there too? It's also just absolute grassroots in the sense that Nick was the only politician who's ever knocked back the Qantas Club and he'd sit in Gloria Jeans and he would have regular conversations with regular people to work out what the heck is going on in their lives. And that is so important, fundamentally important. And you'd hear all these politicians say, oh, well, you know, it's a bit of a fringe benefit. But if it takes you away from the people you're representing, you are actually setting up your own demise. And that's what you see time and time again as they get more and more out of touch. All right, it's a question I specifically wanted to ask you because I know there's an idea you're incubating that this room will be interested in. Um, but we have a question here. Does anyone have a strong view? Yes, Dennis. I'm just trying to remember the name of the theatre company in Wodonga, but it was one of my colleagues here. High Water, th High Water Theatre, it's, it's based in Wodonga, and I, I'm happy to be, be corrected on the detail, but what, what I, I know that happened in our region is that, so that was a, a theatre group set up for kids who are in big trouble, really challenged, not, not fitting inside the, the usual sort of institutions and processes in our society. Um, and they were supported to develop um, a theatre production. Um, they went on, online onto a website and with, the, with support from people around to de um, develop a, a, a crowdsourcing opportunity. They ended up going to Canberra. Cathy met them there at the old Parliament House. Um, 
So they presented their uh, production. Uh, Clive Palmer came along. He took them for a spin in his uh, Rolls Royce. Um, they met Christopher Pine, the Minister for Education, and I understand from, and this is where I'm a little bit short on the detail, but one of these young, young women, they actually, she put a serious question to Christopher Pine about how, education's, how education is rolling out for them. So in a very short space of time, there was a process of con connectivity, and I don't know, but I sense that those kids will never be the same again in terms of how they feel about how much power or, or, or not they think they had. Um, it, it's a very powerful example, I suppose, of if you connect with your community, if you find the way in which you can join some dots, take their voices, irrespective of how quiet they may be relative to others, but listen to those voices, then um, there's an example of what can happen. We'll go to our next question, yes. I know that um, from the region of uh, the electorate of Indi, Cathy has a, an open invitation to anybody who wants to spend time, come and visit the office in Canberra, work, volunteer, you know, volunteer is probably the right word, participate in your own responsibility in a democracy to engage with the political system. Um, and so there's a, a rolling opportunity um, for her that she'll uh, line up meetings with people. If you've got an issue, if you've got a team of people you want to take to Canberra on a particular lobbying process um, from that region, she'll, she'll help with that process. But around her, she's got a lot, of, a lot of people who will help her. She's had a lot of experience with you know, the rough and tum tumble of, of life. And so, as I said before, a lot of this, this stuff that we've been talking about, the negative side is some kind of meaningless theatre that feeds somebody, but I'm not sure, you know, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to d do damage. Rowan, um, can I ask you about a particular idea you're thinking about that you might want to share with us? Well, Joanne and I are thinking about it, I should say, for okay. the record, we've both been. Um, we had been looking, uh, obviously, at the Xenophon uh, model and what had happened. This is before we had every man and his dog declaring their own party up in the Senate. But there certainly <laughs> seemed to be a passion for not necessarily disorganised voices, but different voices and voices that weren't bought. And I think that there is a feeling amongst many people that I speak to that it, unless it's bought by the union movement or it's bought by big business, it's kind of owned by somebody and it's not really there for you. We are still having conversations, well, not still, we are, it's an active conversation taking place around the country with um, like-minded people who may, you know, potentially form at some point a loose arrangement that might um, bring together... <laughs> Less Ricky Muir and more sort of reason thinking, hopefully. And um, Another party? I don't know whether you'd call it a party, because uh, I think the party brand is tarnished and that's just the spin doctor in me, sorry. Uh, but um, certainly they're definitely... People seem to want diversity of opinion, but not necessarily every you know, child wins a prize in the Senate as well. So somewhere yes. between those two things, <laughs> maybe where, um, where we end up. There's definitely, I would strongly argue, a passion for um, different voices. Can you mention some names? Sure, I just won't, but I can. Um, no, I, I can't at this stage because it would be inappropriate. But, I mean, you guys could put your thinking hats on and guess who we're talking to, I would hope. And if not, imagine and call me later on and let me know who we should be talking to. <laughs> um, Joanne, when I um, presented uh, Drive Radio on, on 774 in Melbourne um, and I had a party line segment, which was, you know, usually Ms Left and Ms Right or variations thereof, um, kicking around the political issues of the day, they were all former politicians, retired and um, the moment they got out of the big house, they were absolutely wonderful. They were absolutely wonderful. And they all sort of left their entrenched positions and kind of floated generally somewhere into the reasonable centre, where they'd all sit there madly agreeing with each other. And I think, oh, no conflict yet again, but this is kind of good. And, um, and it sort of occurred to me that the old bastards party would be a really, really great party. <laughs> sort of these, these old guys and old women who, um, you know, had sort of had it with, you know, being up there in the big house, but coming back again, but in this real state, real people speaking directly to you and thoughtfully. Um, are you thinking along those lines? Well, I wouldn't call myself an old bastard, not quite yet. A bastard I should think you'd be proud to call yourself an old bastard. A bastard, possibly, but not old at this point. I'm just clinging desperately to the youth that I used to have. Um, I th look, I think it's a lovely idea. I think there is a lot um, about our binary political system and the party-based political system, which is really, really difficult. You opened Virginia by talking about the 
the um, grassroots support for marriage equality and how community driven that was and how out of sync with that our parliamentarians are. And it occurs to me that almost without exception, anything that's referred to as a conscience issue that requires a conscience vote is one where the community's in leadership about. And I think they also tend to be women's issues. Marriage equality, um, abortion rights. Euthanasia. Euthanasia, all of those things. And I think that there's a way that we should be able to integrate good thinking without it being captured by a party political system, a binary political system, and one which doesn't reduce good public policy debate to three word slogans. Time's over. Hmm. We've got a question over here. Okay, thank you. And just to take that as a comment and a final a quick observation or question, but very short because yeah. time is, is on the wing. Carolyn, do you have anything to add there? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I'd just say that um, for me, uh, stakeholder engagement is not citizen engagement. So I think, um, you know, I'd urge the advocacy sector to really see themselves as facilitators of citizen engagement. Um, because, um, as you know, many of your constituents have, have uh, and the people that you work for, have voices themselves. And how can you, as change agents, bring those voices forward um, and let the decision makers hear those, because I think that's the real power. I think there's a lot of um, a lot of ignoring goes on in Canberra and in the state governments as well, local government of um, stakeholder and advocacy groups, because they've heard it all before. They call you the kind of the incensed and articulate group, you know, and they want fresh voices. But I guess trying to bring those fresh voices from your the people you're connected with is the power that you hold. I think. I think we'll leave it there, and that's a nice note to leave it on. Will you thank our panellists this afternoon, please? Dennis Ginnivan, Joanne Yates, Rowan Wen, and Carolyn Hendrick. Thanks so much for your attention. We hope the rest of your conference goes really well. Thank you.